Today's episode is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio. You'll be hearing more about them later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Forward Marginal Guidance, where Jack Farley and I team up here <laughs> in a combination of on the margin and forward guidance. And we've got Michael Cow with us today. So Michael, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I'm flattered to have both of you. Awesome. Two of my favorite interviewers. Great ah. to be here. Looking forward to it. That's so kind. And thank you for laughing at forward marginal guidance. That is very <laughs> kind of you. Uh, very generous. All right. We've got a lot of ground to cover today. So obviously we're yeah. we're going live here right after the FOMC. So definitely want to get your take on that. We also had the the QRA, the quarterly refunding announcement that went live earlier today. And there was a little bit of movement there. So I want to get your your takes. We've I know you've also been talking about the the Bank of Japan and the move in the dollar yen cross. So those are sort of maybe the, the major areas that we want to cover with you here today. And hopefully by touching on all of those uh, different areas, we're going to tease out your your macro framework. But let's start with the FOMC, Michael. So obviously we we are staying pat. There is no no additional rate hike from Powell. We got a slight move down in the two year. As stocks responded positively, at least at at the current time. This is just a couple minutes after the FOMC. But Powell did reiterate over and over again that they are not even thinking about rate cuts, mm. which a lot of the reporters were keen to ask him about. So. Before we go into too many of the details, Michael, what did you think about the this week's presser? Yeah, I mean, look, that this morning I made a prediction, which looks like it's going to be wrong. Well, unless something really changes in the last 45 minutes. But I thought that this morning we would rally based on the, the quarterly refunding announcement that they would have a have a slightly more favorable mix of more bills and less less duration. Right. And so I thought we would rally on that. And then Powell pretty much said everything I expected him to say verbiage wise, but I did not expect the market to rally on this because to me, I think the the key statement is that they're not even thinking about cuts. And in fact, the real policy question that the committee is still wrestling with is whether or not they're restrictive enough. I think I think a lot of market participants and certainly the market reaction seems to be breathing a sigh that maybe we have seen the last of the cuts. To me, that's almost irrelevant because I think, you know, maybe about a month or two ago, I wrote I wrote this thread called the you know the four horsemen of economic resilience as a paying hom- homage to my 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 favorite band Metallica, and talking about the four horsemen of economic resilience being the the underlying demographic structural underpinnings to the stickiness in both shelter and labor inflation as the first horseman second horseman probably the biggest horseman is this uh, fiscal tailwind right some of which is left over from the covid area fiscal stimulus but some of which is also forward looking in the three bills that this administration has passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill the inflation reduction act and the chips act which I think together account for almost like two trillion of of more fiscal stimulus. The third horseman being the 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 U.S. consumer and corporations relative rate insensitivity relative to other consumers and corporations around the world. So, for instance, we have sixteen. Sorry, we have yeah sixteen trillion of corporate debt, less than twenty five percent of which is floating rate. In Europe, that number is closer to 75%. Similarly, on the homeowner front, on the mortgage front, the U.S. sports one of the lowest percentages of floating rate mortgages. It's almost, it's de minimis. And that's just not the case for much of the rest of the world. That's the third horseman. The fourth horseman is this notion of of energy independence. And I put that in air quotes because I, I don't think that energy independence is going to be here to stay forever. But in the near term, we are still the largest net exporter, uh, exporting 13 million barrels per day. And so when you when you compare and contrast these pillars of economic resilience, you could argue that, okay, maybe the, the, the countries of Europe have some of the structural demographic issues that are causing labor stickiness there. But no other major economy has spent to the degree that we've spent from on the fiscal end of things. I call it the vodka Red Bull effect, right? Because just as the 
Fed has been trying its hardest to administer a depressant. Other branches of a government continue to pour on the Red Bull. And so it's defeating, it's really neutralizing a lot of the Fed's efforts. So to me, the big read through, the big picture read through here is the Fed is through its higher for longer, through higher for much longer, is going to be higher for much longer than the rest of the world can handle. And what that means is that at this stage of the game, the dollar wrecking ball is not going to be driven by the Fed out hawking the rest of the world. It will be driven by the rest of the world buckling and out doving the Fed. And I, you know, you, I mean, in, let's put it this way in Asia, that never even stopped, right? Like, you know, we, we talked about the Bank of Japan briefly. I mean, you know, last time, they did a tweak of yield curve control. It was within 48 hours, they were buying JGBs. This time, it was within 24 hours. <laughs> so, so and, and then the other, the other thing I'll mention is that given the bear steepening we've seen in our long, long end, who cares? You know, the Bank of Japan deliberately didn't put a, a target on its new sort of no pass line for the JGB yield. But, but I mean, even if they, you know, moved it to say 150 basis points, who cares when the US 10 year is yielding almost five? So so I, I, I really think that the US dollar wrecking ball remains the primary uh, wrecking ball to watch. And yeah, so I, I guess we, let's pull on, you decide to pull on whatever threads you wanna pull on out of that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think um, that this risk on rally is going to last. So I think there's a bunch of ways that we could go there, Michael, but maybe one thing to pull on in the last interview that, that you and I had, you know, <clears throat> just going off the global conversation here and the impact of the U S dollar wrecking ball and the feds monetary policy, as opposed to that of other global central banks, uh, you pointed out this very interesting differential in between the twos and tens. Uh, spread in the U.S. Right. and across yeah. other economies. So I'm actually going to share my screen quickly here. So this is a visualization of what rates are doing in the U.S., the two-year, the 10-year, and the 30-year. So if you're following along with on video, this is over a three-month time horizon, and you can see this the teal and the, the orange chart there, the 30-year and the 10-year, and that is screaming up to meet the two-year and essentially uninvert. We still aren't there as of today. So you can see the, the reaction in the market post today's presser. Yields are down across the entire curve. And we're still looking at a, at a yield curve that's somewhat inverted. And I, at least in my head, what I was sort of looking for is, okay, there's an impact to risk premia here. We need to see the yield curve eventually sell off and or, and, or fully uninvert. And then that'll be sort of the maybe the end to this part of the cycle. We haven't really seen that. So can you talk to us about how well, you're looking at yeah, let me let me let me say something else though. It's not even okay. So I have a pinned thread right now that's called "Revisiting Bear Steepening Recency Bias" in that '70s show, and so in it, I have a chart that I want to call attention to. It's towards the. We can put it up. Yeah, not now. Yeah, but later, no, later. So, so the so the chart is basically where I'm comparing the recent bear steepening to what happened in the '79 to '82 sequence, right? So. So I, you know, I originally bought a little bit of TLT as kind of like a counter hedge against a bunch of my like high duration risk shorts. Okay. Mm. But I actually, after doing the research and writing this thread, I actually said, you know what, fuck this. I, I don't, I don't want to own that duration. I don't want to own duration in any asset class. And I'll get into that later because what you see, I don't know if you can pull it up on your screen, but it's the. It's the chart where I'm comparing the yield curve in 79, 80, 81, mm -hmm. and 82. So I think this is this is critical, right? Because what you see happen is that for the first three years in 79, 80, and 81, right, the Fed hiked the front end aggressively. And, you know, just similar to what we had now, initially, you probably you, you saw a muted reaction in the long end, and then eventually the long end repriced in a, in a bout of bear steepening, and it happened like three different times. 
But it's the 82 bull steepening that scares the shit out of me because by the time 82 comes around, right, the Fed started easing the front end and the back end completely blew out because it was the market's way of saying, we don't believe that at that point, inflation expectations had become so ingrained in the zeitgeist of society that by the time the Fed started pulling its, its reins back on the front end, the back end just blew out. It totally blew out. So that, that, was, that was the curve, the 82 curve. That's the one that scares the shit out of me. And in that, I'm sure you guys all watched the, the Paul Tudor Jones interview of Druckenmiller, but mm -hmm. I think he actually obliquely referenced mm -hmm. that as well, talking about how the reason why he's got this bull steepener on is that uh, at some point the, the 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 market loses faith in the in the Fed's ability? So I actually think that you know I I've been voicing a very unpopular opinion that I think the Fed has made a mistake by pausing the last two meetings. I actually think that what they did. I've been looking over the last two FOMC meetings for the Fed to talk about the effect of spreading strikes that have jumped across industries. First, it was Hollywood, and I could basically chalk off. I know a lot about the Hollywood strike, given where I live, and you know, I I would argue that that had less to do with overall cost of living pressure as it had to do with basically the inequities introduced by streaming dynamics. Okay, but what 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 you've seen happen is that that dynamic, right, has jumped industries into autos, into into airlines, into healthcare, and and you just saw that the United Auto Workers Union just basically cinched, cinched the 25% wage uh, hike. The, the pilots union, even though they didn't officially strike, actually secured 40% wage concessions. So like Jay Powell can talk about how, yes, we were seeing some moderation in wage pressure. I guess that's before all of these, these unions have locked in structural price hikes. So my friends, I think the dreaded wage price spiral is here. And so I think the I think Jay Powell is actually kind of pulling an Arthur Burns here by waiting. Today's interview is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio, your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and access a range of Web3 services all in one place. Overseeing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be very complicated. MetaMask Portfolio solves this by giving you the reins to manage your crypto from a single decentralized application or dApp. Just connect to MetaMask Portfolio to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs, and you can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge, and stake crypto assets at competitive rates right within the app from a vetted list of providers. No more jumping between dozens of sites and apps. MetaMask Portfolio lets you do more in Web3 your way, giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all in one place. Manage your portfolio your way with MetaMask Portfolio. Click the link in the description of today's episode to get started. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. To be honest. So what do you think the level of appropriate interest rates is if it's not 525 where they are now? Well, look, the it's not so much the level of interest rates, but it's 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 what is he needed to basically sledgehammer this economy into submission and basically create enough job losses. I hate to say it to lower aggregate demand. His life has been made very, very difficult because of the fiscal tailwind. And that's not their fault. But I think it's it's problematic, I think, in the end for them to be to be waiting, because I, I feel like this is the team transitory thing all over again. And, you know, if they if they wait and wind up having to start restart a hiking cycle, that's going to be a much more painful rug pull than if they went ahead with what was already priced into the the, the dot plus to begin with. So I'm just going to take it take a <clears throat> little spin back. So yeah, in the morning, the Treasury released how it's going to fund itself. And I know you guys know this, but for the audience, like Congress decides how much it wants to, to spend or how much it wants to borrow. It's Treasury's job just to decide how are we going to borrow it or going to issue short term bills or those longer term notes and, and bonds. And the I think 
the announcement today is that it's going to use a lot more bills than the market was expecting than the primary dealer community was expecting and that they may do some meaningful deviation from the relative like 15 to 20 percent split of of bills so they you know they're, they're going to issue short data bills which is stimulative and if you're you know if you were a corporation you would and where you have an inverted yield curve you'd probably want to issue longer term coupon debt 10 year 30 year because those yields are higher the, the point of my my pin thread though was to talk about mm -hmm. how Look, I, I actually think that there's too much emphasis that a lot of macro pundits are putting on the quarter, quarterly refunding. And I honestly think that ultimately it's macro gravity that's driving the bear steeping in the first place. And back to mm -hmm. what, Mike, what you were referring to that I had referred to on our past interview about like the global yield curve. So I have that pulled up again, once again. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, my, my view was, was that you know, in July, when the yield curve was 110 basis points inverted, I was I was simultaneously looking at, you know, for instance, GDP and inflation data across the world, across like the major central banks. And, you know, the 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 other twos, tens curves that I was uh, comparing to the U.S. to were Germany, China, Japan and Italy. And I'm like, OK, how does it make sense that we're our twos tens is 110 inverted, by far the most inverted of all these world yield curves. Just by reference, at that point in time, the Japanese yield curve was positive, like 55 bips, and the Italy yield curve was positive about, about 60 bips. But their economies are so much weaker than ours. How does that make any sense at all? Because and the even, Fed tightened more than, well, than they tightened. But, but, but no, but my point is that the, the long end was mispriced. The long end was mis fundamentally mispriced. And so that leads me to another big conflation argument, which has to do with the quarterly, the emphasis, the overemphasis on the quarterly refunding, which is, oh my God, who's going to buy our debt? No one's going to buy our debt. And, you know, any additional iota of duration is going to crush the bond market because people are scared about the credit worthiness of the United States. No, I completely disagree with that. I think that. It has to do with fundamental macro repricing of where it should be. And, and I think that ultimately it's higher for longer that is repricing the long end. And, you know, it's, it's I, I think what higher for longer, once it really seeps in and people really appreciate the, gr the gravity of it, what it does is it's a wealth, it precipitates a wealth transfer from high duration assets to short duration assets. You're, and, and you're seeing that in the bear steepening, but I've been really thinking about how I want to position my own portfolio from it. And you know we can talk about that, but I, effectively that's what I'm doing too. I'm, I'm trying to own assets whose valuations are primarily determined by short-term cash flows as opposed to terminal value. And I want to be short the opposite. I want to be short asset classes whose primary valuations are based upon terminal value as opposed to current cash flow. Does that make any sense? Yeah. L <clears throat> let, me, let me sum up because there's, there's a lot of meat here. And this is something that we wanted to, to get, in, get into with Michael. So the, the quarterly refunding amounts, and just to sum up you know, what Jack was saying before, Congress obviously decides how much money the United States is going to spend, and then it's on the Treasury to essentially decide how to fund that. And this 15 to 20 percent, Jack, that you were referring to is sort of what the market thinks, and this is what the, how the Fed, the mix of bills, very short-term bills versus longer-term bonds that the Treasury has, has currently or has uh, historically opted for. Now, the reason that's generally significant, we had Andy Constant and Nick Giovanni, the, the two great beards on the show just a couple of weeks ago, talking about the significance of that percentage and how the Treasury and Janet Yellen were a little bit in between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, the amount of supply that was coming to the market is pretty stupendous, sort of this tsunami of supply, which is causing a repricing in the end of the curve. So that'd be the supply argument as opposed to Michael, sort of the macro gravity argument of higher for longer reality setting in that that you're giving. I don't think those are mutually exclusive, by the way. I think there, there could be- There's definitely a not because there's yeah. a price for everything, right? And so if, right. if, if the curve were priced appropriately in the first place, then you would have the demand appetite. But, right. Right? So that, that, would, that would be my argument. They're, they're definitely not mutually exclusive. They're, they're related, but- my point is right. that 
it, it, the, the macro is what determines the price. Price is what determines demand. Right. So a hundred percent. So a new clearing rate needs to be decided on, especially for the longer end of the curve, which is presumably what's happening right now, right? That's why we're ha we're watching this repricing in real time. But my question to you is, and this was Andy and Nick's point, maybe we should get them back on the show as well, <clears throat> was that the reason there, that the treasury was in a little bit of a tough spot here is because it's that 15 to 20% could be a little bit of a tell for the market. So on the one hand, where they could go wrong is bring way more bonds to market than there is demand, which you could see sort of a less orderly repricing in terms of that longer dated debt. Or on the, but on the other hand, the way that the other option that they have is to issue more bills and go above the 15 to 20% ratio that they've historically held. But in a sense, that also signals to the market like, hey, we're actually a little bit worried here, <laughs> right? So we're going to break this, this, we're going to break this pattern that we've historically held and it signals that there's a problem to the market. Um, so I, I'm curious, Michael, like how, how much do you think that that signal really matters here? And then I've got some more sort of specific questions about the the high I mean, for longer. I, you know, I, to, to be honest, I haven't focused on that on that aspect. It's a, you raise an interesting point about the signaling, and I haven't really thought deeply about that because I think I th again, for me, my 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 guiding principle is the underlying the underlying macro and what determines the price in the first place. And I I I think to me that's the that's the bigger issue, right? I think I think what you asked the right question. What is the new clearing price. And, you know, that, that Druckenmiller interview really, it's when, when he pointed out about how everybody under the sun refied except the U.S. government, I mean, that's, it's super, super frustrating to hear because, it, and it's true, because when I wrote that bear steepener thread last summer, it was exactly this idea that we need to think out of the box here and the Fed, in conjunction with Treasury, could have issued as much duration as they wanted. So what if they reprice the 30 year from 180 to 230, you mm -hmm. know, or, or even three and a half percent. But like I was basically envisaging a solution where let's say that the Treasury, in conjunction with the Fed, decided to engineer a bear steepener. That took our yield curve to three percent to to six percent on the long end, but and and to get to that six percent, we would have termed out a shitload of debt along the way, right? At at yeah. much lower coupons, but we if we had done that, maybe the Fed didn't have to take the short end to five and a half percent. Maybe they could have stopped at three and kept the yield curve normal shape. Now that's that. Uh, something like that has never been done before. But again, to me, that was like a first principle solution to to a pretty tough problem. But, but now I fear that we are now in the late 70s, early 80s dynamic where we're going to we're going to have our cake and eat it, too, in a bad way. We, we've now hiked the front end to five and a half percent, which has already caused some some problems. It's going to cause further problems. But but now the the long end is is starting to reprice itself and we may get we 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 may wind up getting the bear steepener further bear steepening followed by you know it, eventually a bull steepener and that that to me is it, it's that 82 dynamic that scares me where like that eventual bull steepener like in today's in today's yield curve, that 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 would take the thirty year to like seven or eight percent. Sure, but Michael, that was coming out of a recession, and we haven't had a recession yet. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like you don't expect a recession. It sounds like you're a pretty big bull on U.S. economic activity. No, I no no okay. no 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 no. You're mistaking me. I think that in the end, the Fed will sledgehammer this thing, but they are doing too slow of a job in doing it it will happen but it's taking too long and so i i i think that it would it would have been better to pull the band-aid off and do it quicker than than to drag this thing out and i think that they're now running the risk of dragging this thing out the recession is going to come i have no doubt it's coming 
but it's definitely been pushed off. I, I originally thought, right, that by Q4 of this year, we would start to really see unemployment start picking up and, you know, potential recession. We're nowhere near that. We just printed yeah. this 4.9%. And it wasn't just you, Mike. I'd say that was mainstream opinion a, a year ago and even going into this year. Yeah. And with the bank's failures and that Nick Timmerow's questions today to, to Powell about, mm-hmm. and it's funny, we haven't really talked about the Fed meeting of saying 500 basis points of increase in, in rates, a small banking crisis, yeah. and then quantitative tightening. It's it's not enough to derail the economy from it's it's you know below trend potential. So Michael, I'm curious as as well about the structural demand for treasuries. You talked about oh, I don't think it's about the supply. I think it's the macro drivers. I you know the economy performing better than expected. It definitely is that. But well, that's the demand side, right? Because like the quarter the, quarterly the, refund the, stuff is focused the, that's on the, supply the, dynamics. That's part of the, the demand of, of people who have right. money and who can spend it across the fixed income spectrum. Do they want to buy a lot of duration if, if the economy is better than expected? No, they don't. Yes. But there's also how much money is there to to buy stuff? And that goes into something in the in the QRA that was referenced today, such as a strong dollar, you know, disinclines other, <clears throat> you know, foreign central banks, they have to sell dollars in order to, to defend their currency, yep. stuff that I don't really understand with the you know, Japanese yield curve. You said if Bank of Japan, if, if yields are on JGBs are, are close to zero and in the U.S. They're, they're 10 years. But I think the way that the, the yield curves are is like the hedging cost is actually making, you know, it's for a Japanese uh, investor, it actually is a worse time to buy treasuries now that they're at, you know, 5% than when they were at, at, at 2%. And also something that we're, you know, I've done my own work on this is just the be- commercial bank holdings of treasuries. They bought so many treasuries and agency mortgage backs in 2020 and 2021 and their ability to absorb more paper and more issuance as the amount of bank deposits is going down is is limited and they, they i mean and, they, 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 and, and related to that their ability to issue loans right extend mm-hmm. loans is limited because they're mm-hmm. tied up right they can't they're not able to to do essentially do anything because to to do anything to to liquefy their held to maturity portfolio would to would be to crystallize losses so, so I, I, I think, I think these are all arguments in favor of recession coming, but it's definitely been prolonged. I mean, you know, I've, I've been, so one, one out of the box trade that I've been doing as a way of having short duration current yield is I've been buying closed ended funds on CLO equity. And if you know how CLOs work, right? I mean, it, it's a it's a cash flow. You're, you're basically getting the waterfall of cash flows after like the triple A's down to the triple B's have been paid off, right? But would you believe that I'm basically getting as of last week, I was buying this stuff at 25% current yields. No, right? 25%. I, mean, I thought you were saying 12 and I was going no, to pretend 20, to be surprised, but now I actually am surprised. 25 percent current yields and so and and, well this week it kind of repriced now they're only only 22 and a half percent current yields but i mean what i I had i had a chat with the the portfolio manager of this the clo equity manager today and you know it's the same thing i mean you know senior loans that you know what the default rate is it's 1.3 percent and i'm shocked uh, right. Like I thought, I thought that, you know, mm-hmm. w- the, the way, the way bank loans and, and, and levered loans, leverage loans work is that they're typically, you know, SOFR based, SOFR plus a spread. Right. And so when, when SOFR goes from zero to five, a, a small business that has one of these loans on basically has seen their cost of debt capital go from 5% to 10%. And that's, you know, I, you know, I'm involved in uh, one small cap where you know that's that's the harsh reality, and they're forced to basically sell sell business units to delever, right? And so, I'm I'm surprised on the one hand that this huge jump in the risk free rate at the front end hasn't resulted in higher defaults, but I think it has to do with the macro tailwind because this P, this CLO equity PM was telling me today that. 
you know, it's it, it, the the credit metrics have remained relatively sanguine because mainly because to, the top lines of these businesses have remained resilient, which is pretty incredible if you think about it, right? Like 1.3% default rates. The, the, the 10-year average, by the way, for, for bank loan default rates is more like 3%. And, and to put things into perspective, it, during the great financial crisis, we briefly touched at 11% default rates. We're at 1.3% right now with, with 11 rate hikes and Fed funds at 5.5%. <laughs> yeah, so I, I assume a lot of those are commercial and industrial ones. And I know that this argument has been said by people who've been wrong that they're lagging, but they are, they are lagging. So, you know, th that is the 1.3% is going to be higher. It will um, be. Sure. Uh, but you're right. Credit has performed much better than pretty much everyone expected. You know, what, what a, lo a lot of people expected. What was I going to say? <laughs> Michael, what were those CLO equity yields like a year ago or two years ago? Because, yeah, I know, I know senior loans are at 10%. So their spread is like 4% or 4.5%. So, but the spreads in leveraged loans, in leveraged loans, not CLO equity, I know are somewhat complacent and that they're, you're in the same way in, in high yield, you're not getting that much spread. Yes, the yield has gone up because the Fed raised interest rates, but the spread is not huge, indicating any distress as well. So even though the, yeah, the realized exactly default right. is low, the, what the market is pricing for implied default as well is low. So, you know, that's exactly you're, right. Yeah. So, but, but so is 25%, is it really like, obviously that's, you know, pretty, pretty well, part easy of, yield. Part of, well, part of this was a idiosyncratic dynamic with these closed end funds where there was a, there was a retail just shit the bed because like in two days, this thing repriced from 7% uh, discount to NAV to now it's trading at 5% premium to NAV. Historically though, these things, these, these closed-ended funds, because of their yield, trade at like 20 to 40% premiums to NAV to give you an idea of how, thing, how cheap things got last week. So, so that was my big trade last week. But I, I think this is, it's an interesting... You know, I, I tweeted today that I, you know, back, back to this whole, back to my comment earlier about how I think what higher for longer portends is a, is generally a transfer of wealth from high duration to short duration. So, so I think of my own portfolio as kind of a macro capital structure arb where, you know, I'm, I'm barbelled between, for instance, a, a, a big T-bill ladder at, at the one year point or less, right? And then I have this, this closed-ended fund in CLO equity, which is also, if you think about it, it's also a short-duration credit instrument mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, right, when you think about how to value an asset, this, the, the, the cash flow part of the DCF is so dominant relative to the terminal value, that's what makes it a short-duration asset yeah. versus a lot of growth stocks where that mix is exactly opposite, where the entire valuation is not on current cash flow and all on terminal value on the come value, right? So I want to be short the latter. I want to be long the former. Yeah, and and duration floating rate loans, you know, by, by definition, have a very low duration. Sorry, floating rate well, loans. Well, interest but, rate wise, they have no duration. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. By definition, but I'm talking from a even from a credit standpoint because the cash on cash yield is so high, it, it relegates the terminal value component of valuation to a, a, a relatively unimportant component of overall value, if that makes sense. Yep. Mm. But, but in equity, the duration is a rigid concept in, in credit and fixed income. In equity, it's kind of just a, a narrative like, oh, NVIDIA is a long duration asset. But you know, Nvidia is oh, totally, totally it totally is. I mean, yeah. that's a perfect example, right? I mean, there's there's there there are current cash flows, but essentially, I mean, you know, if you if you think about it, right, like any super high multiple stop is by definition a high duration equity. I I, I you know I I had this back and forth with Bob Elliott last week, and I and Bob Elliott made this comment that you know people are going to start realizing that there are bonds in those equities, and I said. That's a hundred percent the way I've always looked at the capital structure because that's such a great quote. I quote. love that quote. It's a, I it's listen. A wonderful quote. Yeah, that's a great quote. I, mean, I, I love it too. But yeah. I thought the same thing a year ago, and people did not think about the bonds in Nvidia. They got very excited about the bonds in Nvidia this year. You know, and they were bonds because bonds is fixed income and equity grows. As as a former capital structure arm, right? I've always thought of the capital stack 
as a continuum. If you think about it, right, the, the, the nomenclature of what makes a stock a stock and what makes a bond a bond, those are artificial terms. What you have is a continuum of securities that are bundles of cash flows. And as, as you get down towards the equity-like securities, they tend to have the, the more what we associate as equity like characteristics usually refer to higher duration, right? Higher terminal value component. So, so I would argue, right, that as a, as a, as sort of a, a value, as a, a seeker of value across the capital stack, I liked to look for equities with bond like characteristics. And sometimes I like to look for bonds with equity-like characteristics. It's all a continuum. But th this current macro is favoring the short duration securities, whether you're talking about equity or fixed income. I, I want to I press you for, for more details about that, Michael. But just to, just to return to the presser a little and to get a sense of, because you know, I, I heard you say that may, this this. Powell could be going down as as Arthur Burns here, and you know, you've referred a couple of times this speech, uh, this sort of fireside in between Paul Tudor Jones and and Stan Druckenmiller when when Stan had some or Stan Druckenmiller had some pretty choice words for Janet Yellen. I actually believe that <laughs> he said this might be the largest financial stake a mistake since the days of Alexander Hamilton, who was I believe, yeah, he was he's basically the first. So it, yeah, no small words from 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 Stan Druckenmiller there. I guess I maybe just I'm not even saying I don't agree that this couldn't have been handled better, but let me just play devil's advocate um, and poke at that idea and and get your thoughts. Just in terms of the hiking cycle, you know, we we started very extreme. We were in ZERP for a very long period of time. No comment on whether or not the the fiscal and monetary bazooka that we fired at the U.S. during COVID was the right move or not, but. We woke up at some point and we did start to hike rates. And it was it was in terms of acceleration, one of the fastest rate hike cycles that we've ever done. And we did take rates to about, you know, to five, over 5% uh, federal funds rate. And, you know, to be fair to the Federal Reserve, I think how I'd be thinking if I were in Jay Powell's position is, okay, this is, frankly, I'm a little surprised that the market is still standing here, you know, mm. based on uh, the amount of speculation and fragility that I would have expected in the system. Kind of shocked nothing larger has broken. We obviously had some troubles in the banking system earlier this year, but it seems like the BTFP sorted that out. And now I yep. maybe there's a little bit of a sense of unease, actually, about we know that this acts on a long and variable lag. Powell has repeatedly said that. He said it during this presser, but he's been saying that during the last six or so. So he's sort of, in my book, if I had to defend him here, doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's saying, look, we are we are not done with our job. If anything, we are more, we are considering more rate hikes as opposed to rate cuts. And we would not hesitate to do that for a minute. We don't view that the inflationary impulse has been totally stamped out. So indicating more of a hawkish sort of tilt. And I and I guess. What has been working against him, frankly, is fiscal, which he doesn't have much control over. In the past, he has explicitly said, I'm not going to comment on fiscal. I believe during the last presser, he broke that and said, yeah, our, our fiscal position is actually untenable, maybe showing signs that he's pretty frustrated on something that's outside of his direct control. So, yeah. and I guess the worst thing that could happen, right, is if they kept hiking rates and something, eventually when something really does break that can't get broken, my my assumption, and you tell me, you tell me if you think differently, would be that they would need to step into the market, and then they would undo a lot of the the work that they had done anyhow. So, what would you say to some of that some of that pushback that they they have sort of done what they reasonably could be expected to do? Yeah, I mean, I I I guess I don't disagree. Where I where I where I where I push back a little bit is just the, I think the last two Fed meetings, despite seeing look the, i think the data are mixed i mean yeah yes you're seeing like for instance like you know pmis come in weaker and you're seeing all these metrics come in come in weaker but on the other hand you're seeing the the fundamental metric that they care about is not weaker it's actually reaccelerated right we're talking about core core pce and and even non core and so you know, it, it's 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 not an easy job for sure. I do I do agree that I think the I think the primary problem here is the fiscal. I mean, you could argue, and 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 by the way, that that 
that demon is bipartisan, right? I mean, you know, it definitely, we spent like crazy during COVID. You could argue though, that with COVID, without the benefit of 2020 hindsight, we didn't know what we were dealing with. And it was unprecedented to basically completely shut the economy. So you could argue that we, we had to do what we had to do. But what I find unconscionable is the continued spending post COVID that continues to this day. And I think that's what Druckenmiller is pointing out as well, right? Full agreement so, on that, by the yeah. way. I still haven't heard a yeah. great explanation for what the thought process was behind that. Like the at the amount of time that we were, I mean, even just the amount of treasuries and MBS that we were buying when inflation was a five handle on CPI. I mean, right. I just straight well, that, up don't understand that, that what the thinking was on completely that. Completely put on Powell's lap, right? I mean, I don't know mm. why they were doing that. And there were there were very loud comments like, why the fuck are you still doing that? And they continued. And so I, I so so to me, I, if there's any any fault, I would say that, look, Powell now in in he, they should be able to recognize the these these four horsemen of economic resilience, if, if not the other three, but certainly the fiscal one, which is the largest of the horsemen and be and be able to pivot, not not pivot, but, you know, p- adjust their policy accordingly. In other words, I think that the recognition of the strength of the fiscal tailwind ought to have informed a a more hawkish response, at least to not have paused right now. And it's it's weird though, because there has been no talk about these strikes. I think it's kind of a big deal, but there has been no talk about it. I think that these strikes are basically locking in. This is exactly the, I mean, Powell in today's presser and in the last couple of pressers always talks about how we need to uh, prevent inflation expectations from getting embedded in the economy. Dude, too late, pal. Too late. <laughs> it's already embedded because the unions are emboldening each other to, to, to rest these concessions, 25 percent, 40 percent concessions. What do you think is going to happen then? to car prices down the line or airline prices down the line or healthcare prices down the line. It's going to get passed through. So could I just actually, I agree with you so much on that, that that has not received enough, that has not received enough attention. And one, one contrast that I would draw to you here and always hesitate to talk about this because I don't want to make it a political thing. I think you said it best. This is a bipartisan animal. It's actually the one thing that both parties and the U.S. tend to agree on, which is we're we're okay to spend, spend. quite a bit more money. Spend, yeah, spend. spend the money, baby. No worries. Right. But if you look at actually going back to the early 1980s, I think it was 1981, there was when Reagan was in office, there was the air traffic controller strike, which was, you know, some 13,000 employees. This mm-hmm. was coming a sort of similar situation, right? There had been recession, but this was during an inflationary period. And the air traffic controllers, they controlled what what at the time was thought this this very critical piece of infrastructure, which is if we don't have these air traffic controllers, these planes are going to fly out of the sky. There's going to be some huge accident. Mm -hmm. And Reagan got faced with a huge strike. And he said, what are you going to do? And he did. He he fired all of them. And not only did he fire them, he said, you can never work another federal job ever again. They somehow figured it out. And the response, this I did not think got enough headlines. And again, I don't want to make this political, but the response of the Biden administration was actually to join the union auto workers on the picket line and strike. And I'm yep. just, this has been a concern of mine. I just think, yep. man, you we need the, strong you leadership. Right out of my mouth. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. You, took, you need yeah, strong guys, leadership. Guys, we gotta get, this has been in the context of stagnant real wages for the, for like median income for 40 years, you know, as the stock market has gone up. So I, the economy can take a little bit of of unions, and if that means that the R star in a less you know deunionized world is five percent <clears> instead <throat> of zero, like I like the the negative you know the zero interest rate policy of the past ten years that did not stimulate union activity. So I, I don't think further increases in interest rates will necessarily disincentivize. I mean you know there's the meme of oh you know, honey interest rates are at three percent, so let's cancel our trip to to Disneyland. I think it's the same thing for people. You know are you not going to unionize because we're at 5.75 instead of 5.5. Oh, I'm saying I'm I'm not blaming yeah. that the the unions doing what they need to do, right? Because mm-hmm. it the co- cost of living is imposing a huge burden 
on 99% of the population, right? But but this is where this is where you know you go back to inflation being the most regressive tax of all, and and I this is why I think you know I get a lot of heat when I, I it's such an unpopular thing to say that you know I think the Fed should continue hiking and create job losses, but you know what? Let's just let's just let's just put this into perspective, okay? The job losses we're talking about to take our current unemployment rate to say one full percentage point ha- higher is a million and a half job losses. Yeah, that sucks for the million and a half people. But you know what also sucks? It's inflation for 350 million people. And that's that's the bigger problem, right? And so it's because that that in it because that inflation problem is not being solved quickly enough that's emboldening these unions to then take actions that further build in structural wage pressures that are now structural. They're not going to get undone. They're going to feed through to higher prices. That's not a good dynamic. I tend to agree. By the way, the reason I usually don't love to mention this is because I don't want to it's not a political commentary. It's just a commentary on the realities of the situation. 100%. And, and this is, by the way, just to attach some explanation for why did Powell keep his finger on the buy button for so long? He was looking at the labor market, right? The Fed has target. They have a dual mandate. And one of those mandates is full employment. And employment was lagging coming out of the, the COVID pandemic. And that is still a gigantic issue. And Jack, I love that point. By the way, there's a full, maybe we can even get it. There's a whole thread about this. Like, oh yeah, you know, I, my house is worth twice as much as it was. My wages are way up and uh, you know, my mortgage is 3% now, but, but yeah, like let's not go to Disneyland because the the tenure just hit 5%. Nobody thinks like that, but, but embedded in that, I think very true statement is how people actually think, which is their mortgage, right? The, The price of their home and whether or not they have a job. And I, I, it might just be as simple, right? It's like 70% or what's the percentage? So I don't say something dumb, but a very large percentage of US GDP is consumer spending. Consumer spending has consistently printed hot numbers. And maybe that's just because everyone's house is much more valuable than it used to be. Everyone locked in super low rate mortgages and nobody lost their job. So all of this stuff that the three of us are talking about on this podcast is largely theoretical to them. And the average person in the US ironically, despite being miserable, is uh, better off financially than they were before. And maybe that's just a simple, maybe that's, maybe that's just it, right? I also think just to, just to push back on both of you for the treasury and the, the sort of Stan Druckenmiller comment about issue, issuance, like the, if you, if you were a private corporation or even better, just an individual trying to, like if I was the U.S. treasury yeah, when if I knew interest rates would going to go from zero to five percent, I would issue a lot of super you know thirty day all all thirty year debt. That's the only thing it could be. But but you know the, the U.S. Treasury it has a holders of debt of various maturities, and they want to replace it with something that's similar. So you can't immediately you know a bank that holds all bills. They're how are they going to go to the thirty year? That's a transition. So it has to go slowly. Secondly, I think that the duration of the U.S. total U.S. federal debt actually significantly widened over the past decade out of the great financial crisis. So to some degree, the U.S. did take advantage of you know, very st- structurally low low rates. And also, I think the, the U.S. wanted to stimulate the economy in 2020 when it was in a recession. And you know, at the time, it did not know that it was going to have one of the probably the, you know, the biggest significant economic rebounds in history. And the way that you, you stimulate is that you you borrow money and you borrow it short term, short, short duration so that you're not, you know, because lo- shorter duration requires less balance sheet to, to finance. And then quantitative easing is all about, is about, all about uh, reducing duration uh, of the, of the debt as well. So I, I think it was, yeah, it was, it was a direct policy. And given the uncertainty of the time, they wanted to be stimulative. So that's how I'd say. It was a big mistake. I mean, would you believe, by the way, I was just Googling this. Would you believe that? The UK, France, Italy have all sold 50-year bonds. Ireland and Belgium has mm-hmm. have sold 100-year bonds. Yep. Didn't Austria. Switzerland do that too? 
I think, or Austria. Uh, Austria's Austria. got a 100 year. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree yeah. with you. I would want to see the US have a 50 and 100 year. I agree with you. Okay, let me let me ask you guys this because I actually I don't disagree with you, Michael. I'm just firmly playing devil's advocate at this standpoint. How much worse off do you think the banking situation would be if the US had termed out its debt? That is to say, I don't have these statistics offhand, but I would guess who the buyers of bonds were when the deposits were flowing in was the banks. Yeah. I do wonder how much worse the losses would be in these bank portfolios if the US had just been selling all they could get out, you know, all they could do of 10 and 30 year notes. But, but see, here, here's, here's my pushback to your pushback. The, oh. the, the, the point here is that we did not term out our debt and the long end has repriced anyway. And so now back to my comment about the cake and eat it too from a bad side, we're going to get it. So we, it wouldn't have been better if we had actually proactively bear steep in the curve rather than the market do it for you and not have availed yourself of taking advantage of cheap duration. Hence why I'm not really defend. I'm not really, I'm just poking at it here. I, I don't know the answer to this. Yeah. It seems like they should have done that. 100%. Because, because look, if the, it, it's impossible to prove a counterfactual, right. But I can guarantee you that if they had done that and created a Silicon Valley banking crisis, they would have gotten tremendous heat for doing it, right? But guess yeah. what? We wound up getting it anyway. <laughs> we wound up getting it anyway. And meanwhile, we, 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 the, the, the U.S. Treasury hasn't done anything. Like, you know, I, ho hopefully you guys have, you know, turned out. I mean, I, my, my, I, I still think the, the best trade that I did in the last, like, three years was, you know, doing a huge cash. My, my version of being short bonds was doing a huge cash out in 2021 and locking in at like two and three eighths. <laughs> but, yeah. but like, if I did it, why, why can't the treasury have done it? <laughs> yeah. I, let me, let me ask you this just to bring it back a little bit towards today. So what the, the market reaction to this has generally been, I'm sort I'm watching the two year, 10 year and 30 year here just drift lower. And it's been <laughs> a, a really strong day for stocks. So and Michael, what's your explanation for that? Do you think the market is just misinterpreting this? Is it moving off of the expectations of the QRA being lighter in terms of issuance than the market had been expecting? What's what's describing this? Yeah, this I, I'm, price I'm action here? honestly, I'm I'm perplexed because I think that for a while my early morning prediction looked like it was about to be true, and then we rallied into the close. So I'm I'm perplexed by it. I think that I, if I were to guess, it's probably like a relief rally that that you know a lot of people are interpreting this as the as the that that the Fed has already finished with its hikes. But you know, I think there there were some tells. I mean, like you know, that, I, I guess at the end of the day, the dollar did weaken a little bit, but for most of the day. The DXY was in positive territory. Gold, in particular, sold off. Oil sold off. So those are interesting kind of tells. The equity markets chose to ignore them, but we'll see. See what happens. I don't. I I think that the the key here was never whether or not the Fed was going to hike anymore. The key here, at least what I was looking for, was the the higher for longer language. And I think. The big the the big comment that I keyed off of immediately was, you know, he repeatedly said that the committee is not even focused on cuts. And the primary question that we're still wrestling with is whether or not we're even restrictive enough. So I'm surprised that the market didn't sell off on that, but we'll see what the rest of the week portends, because I'm I'm highly skeptical that this risk rally holds. So Mike, my, my, you were <clears throat> right about the treasury that the duration issuance would be lighter. So bonds, bonds rallied and stocks rallied as well. But the, the Fed meeting, you thought that it would be higher for longer. And you think that there was a lot on the longer rather than, than the higher. And I, you could be right that it doesn't matter whether the Fed is going to do one more hike or, or and then the long run, it's about how high they keep rates. But yeah. I think that what the market really does care about is the next marginal rate increase, and just looking at you know CME, the very short term it does. Yeah, apparently. yeah, yeah. So, 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 but we're talking about the, sh the short term. So, like a day ago, yeah. it had the odds of a hike in December as twenty eight percent, and now it's fifteen percent. So the odds of a, the hike have you know pretty much been cut in half, and fifteen percent 
is pretty close to zero when it comes to to the the CME. You know, I'd say it goes you know sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, and then and then, and then zero. Like a five percent chance means zero. But obviously, we're we're you know, we're six six weeks away. So yeah, but I thought Powell he made it somewhat clear that the the you know he 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 was I would say he was not hawkish on the hiking more. He was very stern on we're not thinking about thinking about cuts in the same way right. they you know we're not thinking about thinking about hikes in 2020. Right. But what the market cares about is the next marginal hike because if you know that it cares about the next move. Cuz the all of the curve is going to be priced on what's the next move. Mm. I mean again 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 if you if you believe that then the dollar would be a lot weaker, right? But the fact that the dollar is look looks to me like it's about to make another run at last fall's highs suggests that I think the, you, you have to look beyond the, the next marginal fed move. You have to also look at what it portends for the rest of the world. I think, I think, I think the ECB is going to be very, very hard pressed. And also to the BOE are going to be hard pressed to stay um, higher for longer than the fed. And so so from that perspective, I think the the dollar wrecking ball is going to continue to wreak havoc across at global asset classes. I don't think U.S. equities will be will remain unscathed. I think somebody I had an exchange with somebody saying that you think you know why do you think there's further downside to to equities? I'm like, wait a second. I don't to put things into perspective. When you look at the QQQ, that's still up like 35 percent year to date or whatever. And the multiples being what they are, I don't think the downsides that even really started. I don't think that equities are priced appropriately for this micro macro environment at all. So that's I think that's that's the big thing. It's it's a combination of of what what the implied discount rates are, but also what what this is going to do for you know, top line and growth expectations for companies all across the spectrum. But again, the, the ones that are most vulnerable are whose valuations are primarily terminal value as opposed to current cash flow. Mm. So maybe, maybe in closing question here, the, or, you know, as we start to wind down, I think a couple of things I'd like to probe at you about the higher for longer, and then just want to ask a little bit about your own expectations around inflation. So in terms of higher for longer, if I'm understanding why it's painful, especially most corporates, let's say in the US are funded at the longer end of the curve, right? So what they haven't had to do <clears throat> is refinance at these higher rates yet. So is that the forcing function for stocks starting to or the stock market starting to turn? Or how do you see the higher for like, what's sort of the forcing function for higher for longer? And what is the the time horizon? That you expect that to take place on? Well, okay. So, so again, I, 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 I learned a lot by delving deep into this, this CLO equity play that I've been, that I've been researching and investing in. What's so, it called, Michael? I'm not going to comment on specific tickers, but there's, there's, there's a couple of closed end funds that, that are CLO equity funds. They're, they're like three I can think of. You know, because the the CLO equity cl asset class is largely an institutional class. It's very difficult mm -hmm. for most people to actually go and buy and, do, and much less do the due diligence on individual CLO equity. So closed end funds are the best way to play. But where was I going with this? Ah, so for the one that the one that I'm familiar with, it's interesting because the the short term maturities are very very light almost de minimis in 2003 and 2004 there there is a pickup in 2025 so i think i think the first hint of that of that refi stress is going to be in 2025 now that's that's for the leveraged loan borrower okay you could argue though that for so if you again remember my comment about i'm i'm thinking about my positioning as like a macro capital structure arb mm -hmm. at, at a, at a 30,000 foot view. This is how I look, I look at it. You've got the senior most part of the capital stack, meaning senior secured loans still holding up very, very well, despite the risk-free component spiking five and a half percentage points. Okay. That's the top of the capital stack. The 
rest of the capital stack from a macro standpoint, I'm talking about mezzanine, high yield, equity. Those cushions are still fat, fat cushions, especially the equity layer of the capital stack, trading at crazy, crazy multiples. So from a macro standpoint, the reason why I'm comfortable buying the equity tranche of a CLO, which whose underlying collateral is the senior most part of the capital stack, is that for me to have a real default, a, a problem where the underlying collateral, that is senior secured loans, really experiencing a huge surge in defaults, you would have to see the equity markets and the high yield markets shut down as financing alternatives for these for 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 companies. You see what I'm saying? So 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 go go back to that anecdote I told you about where this the small cap that I know of is struggling with, you know, a term loan that went from, you know, so for plus 500, right? 5% money now to 10% money, right? Because this is a senior secured term loan, right? They are going to do everything they can to cure or to prevent a default of that term loan, even if it means selling some of their business units units to private equity or to whoever, right? It doesn't even be, it doesn't even have to be where the underlying company that needs to deliver can tap. You know, if if, if it's a public company we're talking about, the underlying company can tap equity markets that are wide open. They can tap the high yield markets that are still wide open. They can tap the convertible markets that are still wide open, right? But even if the underlying borrower can't directly tap those asset classes, they can still sell parts of their business to private equity and or strategic buyers who can. So from a from a macro standpoint, OK, what I am looking for is. I am looking for the equity layer and the high yield layers to materially get impaired and sh be shut off as funding alternatives for companies before I start getting worried about a major default cycle in the senior part of the capital stack. But but Mike, the reason the high yield market, the reason that uh, high yield spreads are so low is because issuance is so low because yields are so high that companies don't want to refinance unless they have to. There, the reason why, not, I don't know that I buy that though, because if, if you've got if you've got if you've got senior loans that are effectively giving total return buyers ten percent instead of five percent now, I, I I think that I I think there's just a lag, right? So like so for I'll give you an example, right? So if you think about I, I, I had this issue when I was trying to immunize my my capital ARB portfolio from specific credit risks, where if you have, let, let, let's say that if you think about the components of total return from a, from a fixed income perspective, right? Let's say a, if, if you have a 8% yielder in a ZERP environment, mm -hmm. right? What happens and what happens if the risk-free rate, that is the zero in ZERP, goes from zero to 3% all of a sudden. Well, all of a sudden, you actually see an initial compression in the credit spread because the risk-free component of that 8% went from zero to 3% and the credit spread went from 8% to 5%, mm -hmm. right? But that's just a knee jerk because at the, at, at the beginning of the cycle, the total return buyers are just still underwriting to the 8%. It, it takes a little bit of time for the total return buyer to realize Wait a second. That eight percent yielder in ZERP probably shouldn't yield eight percent anymore. Probably should yield eleven percent. It takes time, and so right now yeah. that adjustment hasn't really happened yet. Is what I'm saying. But but higher for longer will make it happen eventually. Isn't that a way of saying that these loans are to some degree <clears throat> overvalued because the spreads have gone down? They're not pricing in. The risk and also you're pricing in a recession. I mean, my, Mike, Mike has got to go. We should we should close this. But inter interesting talk. I 
I, it absolutely is. I've, maybe just in closing, because I'd love to get your prediction here, Michael, and then we can then we can leave it. Uh, I got two questions for you. Uh, if you had to forecast, um, let's see where headline <clears throat> CPI and then real rates are going to be a year from now, how would you do that? Hmm. Headline CPI. I'm going to guess headline CPI in a, a year from now is still going to have a 3% handle. Mm. And I am going to guess that, let's see, it's already November. This is the harder part. I, I, I'm still struggling whether or not I think the Fed is going to ease next year. A lot depends on, again, their path. See, that the, the difficulty I have in making that prognostication is that if they had hiked the last two meetings, I would say that there's a decent likelihood that they would have slowed things down enough that maybe by this time next year, they might have started the easing cycle. Now, I'm not so sure, to be honest with you. Hmm. I am not sure that I, I definitely don't think, but what, what is the yield curve pricing in? I mean, I think it's already pricing in how many eases by this time next year? I'm not sure about that. I'm just not mm. sure about that. So yeah, yeah, it's a tough one. I would add the you know what one of the the sort of interesting <clears throat> uh, buys that you could have made during all this was you, know, you got ten year tips giving you at one point two and a half percent real yield, and that is and that's still I think it's above two percent. It's like two point three or something like that. So you know, not not exactly a, a bad trade. And I think there's a there's a big difference. Obviously, people tend to be very myopic about rates or where interest or rates and where inflation is going to be. Obviously, both of those numbers in tandem could, could signal a very different environment. Unfortunately, Michael, I think we, we've got to leave it here. You post uh, a, a prolific, you know, very prolific content creator, both on, on Twitter and elsewhere. If, if folks want to find out more about you, follow you, what's the best way to do that? I got that. The Urban <laughs> Cowboy Substack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Er, well, I, you know, I, I wound up getting my own domain. It's urbancowboy.com. <laughs> hey, but, but moving yeah, up that, in the world, that, baby. That basically redirects to my Substack. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to out outsmart um, Elon's uh, downgrading algorithms, but I don't think I don't think that helps <laughs> because any Substack content I post basically gets completely like you know downgraded by by uh, Twitter's algos. Obliterated. Yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> um, all right, Michael, Jack. This was a ton of fun. Um, Always. Thanks.